Chapter Eleven, Lord Grenville's Ball. The historic ball given by the then Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Lord Grenville, was the most brilliant function of the year. Though the autumn season had only just begun, everybody who was anybody had contrived to be in London in time to be present there and to shine at this ball, to the best of his or her respective ability. His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales had promised to be present. He was coming on presently from the opera. Lord Grenville himself had listened to the first two acts of Orpheus before preparing to receive his guests. At ten o'clock, an unusually late hour in those days, the grand rooms of the Foreign Office, exquisitely decorated with exotic palms and flowers, were filled to overflowing. One room had been set apart for dancing, and the dainty strains of the minuet made a soft accompaniment to the gay chatter, the merry laughter of the numerous and brilliant company. In a smaller chamber, facing the top of the fine stairway, the distinguished host stood ready to receive his guests. Distinguished men, beautiful women, notabilities from every European country had already filed past him, had exchanged the elaborate bows and curtsies with him, which the extravagant fashion of the time demanded, and then, laughing and talking, had dispersed into the hall, reception, and card rooms beyond. Not far from Lord Grenville's elbow, leaning against one of the console tables, Chauvelin, in his irreproachable black costume, was taking a quiet survey of the brilliant throng. He noted that Sir Percy and Lady Blakeney had not yet arrived, and his keen, pale eyes glanced quickly towards the door every time a newcomer appeared. He stood somewhat isolated. The envoy of the revolutionary government of France was not likely to be very popular in England at a time when the news of the awful September massacres and of the reign of terror and anarchy had just begun to filtrate across the Channel. In his official capacity, he had been received courteously by his English colleagues. Mr. Pitt had shaken him by the hand. Lord Grenville had entertained him more than once, but the more intimate circles of London society ignored him altogether. The women openly turned their backs upon him. The men who held no official position refused to shake his hand. But Chauvelin was not the man to trouble himself about these social amenities, which he called mere incidents in his diplomatic career. He was blindly enthusiastic for the revolutionary cause. He despised all social inequalities, and he had a burning love for his own country. These three sentiments made him supremely indifferent to the snubs he received in this fog-ridden, loyalist, old-fashioned England. But above all, Chauvelin had a purpose at heart. He firmly believed that the French aristocrat was the most bitter enemy of France. He would have wished to see every one of them annihilated. He was one of those who, during this awful reign of terror, had been the first to utter the historic and ferocious desire that aristocrats might have but one head between them, so that it might be cut off with a single stroke of the guillotine. And thus he looked upon every French aristocrat who had succeeded in escaping from France as so much prey of which the guillotine had been unwarrantably cheated. There is no doubt that those royalist emigres, once they had managed to cross the frontier, did their very best to stir up foreign indignation against France. Plots without end were hatched in England, in Belgium, in Holland, to try and induce some great power to send troops into revolutionary Paris, to free King Louis, and to summarily hang the bloodthirsty leaders of that monster republic. Small wonder, therefore, that the romantic and mysterious personality of the Scarlet Pimpernel was a source of bitter hatred to Chauvelin. He and the few young jackanapes under his command, well furnished with money, armed with boundless daring and acute cunning, had succeeded in rescuing hundreds of aristocrats from France. Nine tenths of the emigres who were fated at the English court owed their safety to that man and to his league. Chauvelin had sworn to his colleagues in Paris that he would discover the identity of that meddlesome Englishman, entice him over to France, and then. Chauvelin drew a deep breath of satisfaction at the very thought of seeing that enigmatic head falling under the knife of the guillotine as easily as that of any other man. Suddenly there was a great stir on the handsome staircase. All conversation stopped for a moment as the major domo's voice outside announced, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, and Sweet, Sir Percy Blakeney, Lady Blakeney. Lord Grenville went quickly to the door to receive his exhorted guest. The Prince of Wales, dressed in a magnificent court suit of salmon coloured velvet, richly embroidered with gold, entered with Marguerite Blakeney on his arm, and on his left, Sir Percy, in gorgeous shimmering cream satin, cut in the extravagant, incroyable style, his fair hair free from powder, priceless lace at his neck and wrists, and the flat chapeau bras under his arm. After the few conventional words of deferential greeting, Lord Grenville said to his royal guest, Will your Highness permit me to introduce Monsieur Chauvelin, the accredited agent of the French government? Chauvelin, 
Immediately the prince entered, had stepped forward, expecting this introduction. He bowed very low, whilst the prince returned his salute with a curt nod of the head. Monsieur, said his royal highness coldly, we will try to forget the government that sent you, and look upon you merely as our guest, a private gentleman from France. As such, you are welcome, monsieur. Monseigneur, rejoined Chauvelin, bowing once again. Madame, he added, bowing ceremoniously before Marguerite. Ah, my little Chauvelin, she said with unconcerned gaiety, and extending her tiny hand to him. Monsieur and I are old friends, your royal highness. Ah, then, said the prince, this time very graciously, you are doubly welcome, monsieur. There is someone else I would crave permission to present to your royal highness, here interposed Lord Grenville. Ah, who is it? asked the prince. Madame la Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive and her family, who have but recently come from France. By all means, they are among the lucky ones, then. Lord Grenville turned in search of the Comtesse, who sat at the further end of the room. Lord love me, whispered his royal highness to Marguerite, as soon as he had caught sight of the frigid figure of the old lady. Lord love me, she looks very virtuous and very melancholy. Faith, your royal highness, she rejoined with a smile, virtue is like precious odours, most fragrant when it is crushed. Virtue, alas, sighed the prince, is mostly unbecoming to your charming sex, madame. Madame la Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive, said Lord Grenville, introducing the lady. This is a pleasure, madame. My royal father, as you know, is ever glad to welcome those of your compatriots whom France has driven from her shores. Your royal highness is ever gracious, replied the comtesse with becoming dignity. Then, indicating her daughter, who stood timidly by her side, My daughter Suzanne, monseigneur, she said. Ah, charming, charming, said the prince. And now allow me, comtesse, to introduce you, Lady Blakeney, who honours us with her friendship. You and she will have much to say to one another, I vow. Every compatriot of Lady Blakeney's is doubly welcome for her sake. Her friends are our friends, her enemies, the enemies of England. Marguerite's blue eyes had twinkled with merriment at this gracious speech from her exalted friend. The Comtesse de Tournay, who lately had so flagrantly insulted her, was here receiving a public lesson, at which Marguerite could not help but rejoice. But the Comtesse, for whom respect of royalty amounted almost to a religion, was too well schooled in courtly etiquette to show the slightest sign of embarrassment, as the two ladies curtsied ceremoniously to one another. His Royal Highness is ever gracious, madame, said Marguerite demurely, and with a wealth of mischief in her twinkling blue eyes. But there is no need for his kind of meditation. Your amiable reception of me at our last meeting still dwells pleasantly in my memory. We poor exiles, madame, rejoined the comtesse frigidly, show our gratitude to England by devotion to the wishes of Monseigneur. Madame, said Marguerite, with another ceremonious curtsy. Madame, responded the comtesse with equal dignity. The prince, in the meanwhile, was saying a few gracious words to the young vicomte. I am happy to know you, monsieur le vicomte, he said. I knew your father well when he was ambassador in London. Ah, monseigneur, replied the vicomte, I was a little boy then, and now I owe the honour of this meeting to our protector, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Hush, said the prince, earnestly and quickly, as he indicated Chauvelin, who had stood a little on one side throughout the whole of this little scene, watching Marguerite and the comtesse with an amused, sarcastic little smile around his thin lips. Nay, monseigneur he said now, as if in direct response to the prince's challenge. Pray do not check this gentleman's display of gratitude. The name of that interesting red flower is well known to me, and to France. The prince looked at him keenly for a moment or two. Faith, then, monsieur, he said, perhaps you know more about our national hero than we do ourselves. Perchance you know who he is. See, he added, turning to the groups around the room, the ladies hang upon your lips. You would render yourself popular among the fair sex if you were to gratify their curiosity. Ah, monseigneur, said Chauvelin significantly, rumour has it in France that your highness could, and you would, give the truest account of that enigmatical wayside flower. He looked quickly and keenly at Marguerite as he spoke, but she betrayed no emotion, and her eyes met his quite fearlessly. Nay, man, replied the prince, my lips are sealed and the members of the League jealously guard the secret of their chief, so his fair adorers have to be content with worshipping a shadow. Here in England, monsieur, he added, with wonderful charm and dignity, we but name the Scarlet Pimpernel, and every fair cheek is suffused with a blush of enthusiasm. None have seen him save his faithful lieutenants. We know not if he be tall or short, fair or dark, handsome or ill-formed, but we know that he is the bravest gentleman in all the world, and we all feel a little proud, monsieur, when we remember that he is an Englishman. Ah, Monsieur Chauvelin, 
added Marguerite, looking almost with defiance across at the placid, sphinx-like face of the Frenchman. His Royal Highness should add that we ladies think of him as of a hero of old. We worship him, we wear his badge, we tremble for him when he is in danger, and exult with him in the hour of his victory. Chauvelin did no more than bow placidly, both to the Prince and to Marguerite. He felt that both speeches were intended, each in their way, to convey contempt or defiance. The pleasure-loving, idle Prince he despised. The beautiful woman, who in her golden hair wore a spray of small red flowers composed of rubies and diamonds, her he held in the hollow of hand. He could afford to remain silent, and to wait events. A long, jovial, inane laugh broke the sudden silence which had fallen over every one. "'And we poor husbands,' came in slow, affected accents from gorgeous Sir Percy, "'we have to stand by, while they worship a demmed shadow.' Every one laughed, the Prince more loudly than any one. The tension of subdued excitement was relieved, and the next moment every one was laughing and chatting merrily as the gay crowd broke up and dispersed in the adjoining rooms. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 The Scrap of Paper Marguerite suffered intensely. Though she laughed and chatted, though she was more admired, more surrounded, more fated than any woman there, she felt like one condemned to death, living her last day upon this earth. Her nerves were in a state of painful tension, which had increased a hundredfold during that brief hour which she had spent in her husband's company, between the opera and the ball. The short ray of hope, that she might find in this good-natured, lazy individual a valuable friend and adviser, had vanished as quickly as it had come, the moment she found herself alone with him. The same feeling of good-humoured contempt which one feels for an animal or a faithful servant made her turn away with a smile from the man who should have been her moral support in this heart-rending crisis through which she was passing, who should have been her cool-headed adviser when feminine sympathy and sentiment tossed her hither and thither between her love for her brother, who was far away and in mortal peril, and horror of the awful service which Chauvelin had exacted from her, in exchange for Armand's safety. There he stood, the moral support, the cool-headed adviser, surrounded by a crowd of brainless, empty-headed young fops, who were even now repeating from mouth to mouth, and with every sign of the keenest enjoyment, a dog-roll quatrain which he had just given forth. Everywhere the absurd, silly words met her. People seemed to have little else to speak about. Even the Prince had asked her, with a little laugh, whether she appreciated her husband's latest poetic efforts. "'All done in the tying of a cravat,' Sir Percy had declared to his clique of admirers. "'We seek him here, we seek him there. Those Frenchies seek him everywhere. Is he in heaven? Is he in hell? That demmed, elusive Pimpernel!' Sir Percy's bon mot had gone the round of the brilliant reception-rooms. The Prince was enchanted. He vowed that life without Blakeney would be but a dreary desert, then, taking him by the arm, had led him to the card-room, and engaged him in a long game of hazard. Sir Percy, whose chief interest in most social gatherings seemed to centre around the card-table, usually allowed his wife to flirt, dance, to amuse or bore herself as much as she liked. And to-night, having delivered himself of his bon mot, he had left Marguerite surrounded by a crowd of admirers of all ages, all anxious and willing to help her to forget that somewhere in the spacious reception-rooms there was a long, lazy being who had been fool enough to suppose that the cleverest woman in Europe would settle down to the prosaic bonds of English matrimony. Her still overwrought nerves, her excitement and agitation, lent beautiful Marguerite Blakeney much additional charm. Escorted by a veritable bevy of men of all ages and of most nationalities, she called forth many exclamations of admiration from every one as she passed. She would not allow herself any more time to think. Her early, somewhat bohemian training had made her something of a fatalist. She felt that events would shape themselves, that the directing of them was not in her hands. From Chauvelin she knew that she could expect no mercy. He had set a price on Armand's head, and left it to her to pay or not, as she chose. Later on in the evening she caught sight of Sir Andrew Foulkes and Lord Antony Dewhurst, who seemingly had just arrived. She noticed at once that Sir Andrew immediately made for little Suzanne de Tournay, and that the two young people soon managed to isolate themselves in one of the deep embrasures of the mullioned windows, there to carry on a long conversation, which seemed very earnest and very pleasant on both sides. 
Both the young men looked a little haggard and anxious, but otherwise they were irreproachably dressed, and there was not the slightest sign about their courtly demeanour of the terrible catastrophe which they must have felt hovering round them and round their chief. That the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel had no intention of abandoning its cause, she had gathered through little Suzanne herself, who spoke openly of the assurance she and her mother had had that the Comte de Tournay would be rescued from France by the League within the next few days. Vaguely she began to wonder, as she looked at the brilliant and fashionable in the gaily lighted ballroom, which of these worldly men round her was the mysterious Scarlet Pimpernel who held the threads of such daring plots and the fate of valuable lives in his hands. A burning curiosity seized her to know him. Although for months she had heard of him and had accepted his anonymity as every one else in society had done, but now she longed to know, quite impersonally, quite apart from Armand, and, oh, quite apart from Chauvelin, only for her own sake, for the sake of the enthusiastic admiration she had always bestowed on his bravery and cunning. He was at the ball, of course, somewhere, since Sir Andrew Foulkes and Lord Antony Dewhurst were here, evidently expecting to meet their chief, and perhaps to get a fresh mot d'ordre from him. Marguerite looked round at every one, at the aristocratic, high-typed Norman faces, the squarely built, fair-haired Saxon, the more gentle, humorous cast of the Celt, wondering which of these betrayed the power, the energy, the cunning, which had imposed its will and its leadership upon a number of high-born English gentlemen, among whom, rumour asserted, was His Royal Highness himself. Sir Andrew Foulkes? Surely not. With his gentle blue eyes, which were looking so tenderly and longingly after little Suzanne, who was being led away from the pleasant tête-à-tête -tête by her stern mother, Marguerite watched him across the room, as he finally turned away with a sigh, and seemed to stand, aimless and lonely, now that Suzanne's dainty little figure had disappeared in the crowd. She watched him as he strolled towards the doorway, which led to a small boudoir beyond, then paused and leaned against the framework of it, looking still anxiously all around him. Marguerite contrived for the moment to evade her present attentive cavalier, and she skirted the fashionable crowd, drawing nearer to the doorway against which Sir Andrew was leaning. Why she wished to get closer to him, she could not have said. Perhaps she was impelled by an all-powerful fatality, which so often seems to rule the destinies of men. Suddenly she stopped. Her very heart seemed to stand still, her eyes large and excited, flashed for a moment towards that doorway, then as quickly were turned away again. Sir Andrew Foulkes was still in the same listless position by the door, but Marguerite had distinctly seen that Lord Hastings, a young buck, a friend of her husband's and one of the Prince's set, had, as he quickly brushed past him, slipped something into his hand. For one moment longer—oh, it was the merest flash—Marguerite paused. The next she had, with admirably played unconcern, resumed her walk across the room, but this time more quickly, towards that doorway whence Sir Andrew had now disappeared. All this— from the moment that Marguerite had caught sight of Sir Andrew leaning against the doorway, until she followed him into the little boudoir beyond, had occurred in less than a minute. Fate is usually swift when she deals a blow. Now Lady Blakeney had suddenly ceased to exist. It was Marguerite St. Just who was there only. Marguerite St. Just who had passed her childhood, her early youth, in the protecting arms of her brother Armand. She had forgotten everything else—her rank, her dignity, her secret enthusiasms everything save that our man stood in peril of his life, and that there, not twenty feet away from her, in the small boudoir which was quite deserted, in the very hands of Sir Andrew Foulkes, might be the talisman which would save her brother's life. Barely another thirty seconds had elapsed between the moment when Lord Hastings slipped the mysterious something into Sir Andrew's hand, and the one when she, in her turn, reached the deserted boudoir. Sir Andrew was standing with his back to her, and close to a table upon which stood a massive silver candelabra. A slip of paper was in his hand, and he was in the very act of perusing its contents. Unperceived, her soft, clinging robe making not the slightest sound upon the heavy carpet, not daring to breathe until she had accomplished her purpose, Marguerite slipped close behind him. At that moment he looked round and saw her. She uttered a groan, passed her hand across her forehead, and murmured faintly, "'The heat in the room was terrible. I felt so faint. Oh!' She tottered, almost as if she would fall, and Sir Andrew, quickly recovering himself and crumpling in his hand the tiny note he had been reading, was only apparently just in time to support her. "'You are ill, Lady Blakeney?' he asked with much concern. "'Let me—no, no, nothing,' she interrupted quickly. "'A chair, quick!' She sank into a chair close to the table, and, throwing back her head, closed her eyes. "'There,' she murmured, still faintly, 
The giddiness is passing off. Do not heed me, Sir Andrew, I assure you, I already feel better. At moments like these there is no doubt, and psychologists actually assert it, that there is in us a sense which has absolutely nothing to do with the other five. It is not that we see, it is not that we hear or touch, yet we seem to do all three at once. Marguerite sat there with her eyes apparently closed. Sir Andrew was immediately behind her, and on her right was the table with the five-armed candelabra upon it. Before her mental vision there was absolutely nothing but Armand's face. Armand, whose life was in the most imminent danger, and who seemed to be looking at her from a background upon which were dimly painted the seething crowd of Paris, the bare walls of the Tribunal of Public Safety, with Fouquier Tanville, the public prosecutor, demanding Armand's life in the name of the people of France, and the lurid guillotine with its stained knife waiting for another victim. Armand. For one moment there was dead silence in the little boudoir. Beyond, from the brilliant ballroom, the sweet notes of the gavotte, the frou-frou of rich dresses, the talk and laughter of a large and merry crowd, came as a strange, weird accompaniment to the drama which was being enacted here. Sir Andrew had not uttered another word. Then it was that that extra sense became potent in Marguerite Blakeney. She could not see, for her two eyes were closed. She could not hear, for the noise from the ballroom drowned the soft rustle of that momentous scrap of paper. Nevertheless, she knew, as if she had both seen and heard, that Sir Andrew was even now holding the paper to the flame of one of the candles. At the exact moment that it began to catch fire, she opened her eyes, raised her hand, and, with two dainty fingers, had taken the burning scrap of paper from the young man's hand. Then she blew out the flame, and held the paper to her nostril with perfect unconcern. "'How thoughtful of you, Sir Andrew!' she said gaily. "'Surely it was your grandmother who taught you that the smell of burnt paper was a sovereign remedy against giddiness.' She sighed with satisfaction, holding the paper tightly between her jewelled fingers. That talisman which, perhaps, would save her brother Armand's life. Sir Andrew was staring at her, too dazed for the moment to realise what had actually happened. He had been taken so completely by surprise, that he seemed quite unable to grasp the fact that the slip of paper, which she held in her dainty hand, was one, perhaps, on which the life of his comrade might depend. Marguerite burst into a long, merry peal of laughter. "'Why do you stare at me like that?' she said playfully. "'I assure you I feel much better. Your remedy has proved most effectual. This room is most delightedly cool,' she added, with the same perfect composure, and the sound of the gavotte from the ballroom is fascinating and soothing. She was prattling on in the most unconcerned and pleasant way, whilst Sir Andrew, in an agony of mind, was racking his brains as to the quickest method he could employ to get that bit of paper out of that beautiful woman's hand. Instinctively, vague and tumultuous thoughts rushed through his mind. He suddenly remembered her nationality, and, worst of all, recollected that horrible tale anent the Marquis de Saint-Cyr, which in England no one had credited, for the sake of Sir Percy as well as for her own. "'What? Still dreaming and staring?' she said with a merry laugh. "'You are most ungallant, Sir Andrew. And now I come to think of it, you seemed more startled than pleased when you saw me just now. I do believe, after all, that it was not concern for my health, nor yet a remedy taught you by your grandmother that caused you to burn this tiny scrap of paper. I vow it must have been your lady-love's last cruel epistle you were trying to destroy. Now confess," she added, playfully holding up the scrap of paper, "'does this contain her final congé, or a last appeal to kiss and make friends?' "'Whichever it is, Lady Blakeney,' said Sir Andrew, who was gradually recovering his self-possession, "'this little note is undoubtedly mine, and—' Not caring whether his action was one that would be styled ill-bred towards a lady, the young man had made a bold dash for the note. But Marguerite's thoughts flew quicker than his own. Her actions under pressure of his intense excitement were swifter and more sure. She was tall and strong. She took a quick step backwards, and knocked over the small Sheraton table, which was already top-heavy, and which fell down with a crash, together with the massive candelabra upon it. She gave a quick cry of alarm. "'The candle, Sir Andrew! Quick!' There was not much damage done. One or two of the candles had blown out as the candelabra fell. Others had merely sent some grease upon the valuable carpet. One had ignited the paper shade over it. Sir Andrew quickly and dexterously put out the flames, and replaced the candelabra upon the table. But this had taken him a few seconds to do, and those seconds had been all that Marguerite needed to cast a quick glance at the paper, and to note its contents. A dozen words in the same distorted handwriting she had seen before, and bearing the same device, a star-shaped flower drawn in red ink. When Sir Andrew once more looked at her, he saw only upon her face alarm at the untoward accident and relief at its happy issue, whilst the tiny and momentous note had apparently fluttered to the ground. Eagerly the young man picked it up, and his face looked much relieved, as his fingers closed tightly over it. 
"'For shame, Sir Andrew,' she said, shaking her head with a playful sigh, "'making havoc in the heart of some impressionable duchess, "'whilst conquering the affections of my sweet little Suzanne. "'Well, well, I do believe it was Cupid himself who stood by you "'and threatened the entire foreign office with the destruction by fire, "'just on purpose to make me drop love's message "'before it had been polluted by my indiscreet eyes. "'To think that a moment longer, and I might have known the secrets of an erring duchess.' "'You will forgive me, Lady Blakeney,' said Sir Andrew, now as calm as she was herself, "'if I resume the interesting occupation which you have interrupted. "'By all means, Sir Andrew, how should I venture to thwart the love-god again? "'Perhaps he would meet out some terrible chastisement against my presumption. "'Burn your love-token, by all means.' Sir Andrew had already twisted the paper into a long spill, and was once again holding it to the flame of the candle which had remained alight. He did not notice the strange smile on the face of his fair vis-à-vis, so intent was he on the work of destruction. Perhaps, had he done so, the look of relief would have faded from his face. He watched the fateful note as it curled under the flame. Soon the last fragment fell on the floor, and he placed his heel upon the ashes. "'And now, Sir Andrew,' said Marguerite Blakeney, with the pretty nonchalance peculiar to herself, and with the most winning of smiles, "'will you venture to excite the jealousy of your fair lady by asking me to dance the minuet?' End of chapter 12